I've called rural landscapes, which are in the Western Isles in Scotland, I didn't realise actually it was going to be such an international audience. So I've kind of assumed a level of knowledge, which I'll try and make up for during the talk. But one of these landscapes basically is kind of world famous, and the other isn't. <coughs> and I want to explore the character of the two of those and juxtapose how they've been studied and kind of basically criticise archaeologists a little bit for their approaches. This is an aerial view of the archipelago of St Kilda on a typical Scottish day. Um, it's quite, a, it's the funny thing about the archipelago is it's very small, but it's very tall. Um, so it's very, the whole place is actually quite challenging in terms of scale. Somebody mentioned scale earlier. But there's about 2,000 archaeological sites on the archipelago, so it's an incredibly dense cultural landscape. Quite unusual, really, in a Western Scottish context. The first thing I want to do is look at some kind of perceptions of the place that are peddled in literature of the past and the present. This, this is a quotation from a book that's for sale outside. It was originally published in 65. It was republished <coughs> recently to great fanfare. And it was written by a very talented journalist who was really young at the time, visited this place for a couple of weeks uh, made a television program about it and then wrote what has become the authoritative history of the place. Um, and the, obviously I've chosen the quote for my own purposes, but it's kind of interesting. So he presents this place as unique and he juxtaposes the place, the cultural landscape, as changeless and the ocean around it as the thing that changes. So this is a, this is a dominant perception of this the rural landscapes. And you can see, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but St Kilda is famous for the population being evacuated in 1930. And you can see that this writer presents that as an inevitability. So he takes agency away from the people and he sees history as something that happens to the people on the island rather than something that they are engaged with actively. This is a quotation from, I was talking to somebody about Fair Isle last night. The Ch Williamson is actually a famous ornithologist, and as is the other chap, a famous naturalist. They worked on St Kilda in the 1950s and 60s. And at the time, they were at the cutting edge of ecology and ornithology, but they became interested in archaeology and history. And they wrote um, a number of popular books and magazine articles about the place that actually dominated perceptions of the place for about a generation. And because they thought history and archaeology were interesting, they did lots of it on the island, including quite well-developed um, typologies of structures. <coughs> but they separated it completely from the wider context. So they, on St Kilda, there's an individual species of wren and an individual species of mouse that exist nowhere else. So there's, if you like, a Galapagos effect. And for those naturalists, that idea was perfectly reasonable to apply to culture as well. Hence this kind of mental statement. Could it be, we often wonder, that in the remotest glen of Scotland there might be a forgotten culture? So this was for them a serious research question in 1960. But these ideas are deeply, deeply embedded in uh, Scottish national consciousness, in the media, in all the numerous books published about this place, and in most of our minds, including mine, before I started to get a bit more clued up. So this is um, just an example of something from the kind of management literature, if you like. And it places this island as representative of this notion of subsistence economy. So it came, for me, that means they're kind of suggesting it's analogous to like hunter-gatherer societies, if you like. They're not, this is a deeply complicated feudal medieval society with lots of complex economic links all over Scotland and the world to some extent. But they're suggesting that it's a subsistence economy. And then they're saying very explicitly, this great thing was ruined by influence from outside. The picture in the background is a, a northern English fishing fleet getting shelter in St Kilda's Bay, i.e. an industrialised international industry actively happening in the place, juxtaposed against a kind of bizarre notion of what that place represents. So. <coughs> I'm going to talk about these about two different islands. So I'm, I'm, because I thought I was mainly going to be talking about Scotland, I haven't done a 
um, European map, if you like. But I'm sure most of you are aware where the Western Isles are. So this just shows how far out St Kilda is, 75 kilometres away. And the other island I'm going to talk about is Pabe, which I'm assuming most of you probably hadn't heard of. I hadn't heard of it until I started working in this area. And the reason I want to talk about the two of them together is that they are inextricably linked historically. So the earliest historical evidence about St Kilda is kind of maybe 14th century. There's a charter in the 14th century. And it makes it clear that these two islands were explicitly linked, i.e. they were owned and by the same clan, if you like, the clouds, and they were managed as part of the same farm, or what in this area is called tack, a tack. So the people that managed St Kilda lived on the island of Pabe, and there was explicit connections between the two, and those connections are borne out in the archaeological landscape, but also in the history of the two islands, their economy, and so on and so forth. So what's, what's extraordinary about this is you could visit St Kilda, read about St Kilda for years and years and years and not actually get this, be completely unaware of it. And so as I said at the bottom, this place which if you go back to say 1800, I'll explain how they become split up, but the place to which it was most inextricably linked has become completely separated off from it. And in fact, if you, if you say to most people in Scotland, if you talk about an island called Pabe, they'll think of the other Pabe, which is for, much further south than the Western Isles. They, they literally won't know about this island. Now, what is particularly amazing about this is, if you take, for example, a book published in 97 about St Kilda, one of the authoritative texts, it's actually a brilliant book, it has a section in it about comparative islands. It uses some Scottish examples, not Pabe, but it also uses Tristan de Cunha. So it, it seriously suggests that we can understand this landscape in comparison to somewhere that's thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away, but that we shouldn't look to its closest cultural companion in order to understand it. Um, this is also true in some of the literature that supported the Knox and Kilda as a World Heritage Site. Some of the literature that supported that nomination refers to Tristan de Cunha. None of it refers to this island, Pabbe. So we have recently, I work for Historic Environment Scotland, we recently published a major book about St Kilda, so this is a kind of offshoot talk from that book. I'm not going to go into the, uh, the actual archaeology in great detail, but just to give you an overview of what is there, or what we think is there after our most recent work. Okay, it's mega remote, but it's visible from the West now, so in my view, there's no question that people went there as soon as they could, could get there. But the earliest actual evidence is from the Neolithic, and there's fragmentary remains of early landscapes. So it's not there's, it's not different to other parts of Scotland in the sense that there isn't lots and lots and lots of prehistory there because the landscape's been intensively used and reused. So there's small fragments. Where it is rich, if you like, is in the post-medieval landscape, and in particular, it's incredibly unusual in that it was an intensively managed island for fowling. So when I mentioned earlier there's something like 2,000 structures on the island, the majority of those are related to the exploitation of birds, including this amazing bothy in the background. This photo was taken in about 1920 on one of the outer islands of St Kilda. That building is actually now completely ruinous, but it, this is an actively used semi-industrial arguably structure in the West Isles in 1920 with some tourists visiting it. It's really quite a difficult place to get to. Nobody goes there now, but it's, it's rope access territory. But the interesting thing about archaeologists working there is initially when they went to St Kilda, they explicitly were looking for ways to understand prehistory. So they were archaeologists didn't go really to the Western Isles to understand the 18th and 19th century. They went because they thought they would see remnants of the past. So they looked at buildings like this as, an, as directly analogous with prehistoric structures. Obviously, nowadays we don't see it like that but that's the history of the study. At the moment, St Kilda is quite different to this notion. So it's one of the main things that go on there is it's a military base, and a lot of the other things piggyback off that because the military basically fund everything, including one and a half million litres of diesel every year to, to run a power station, a nurse, a pier. All the infrastructure is reliant on, on military funding. And also, as I'm sure most of you are aware, it's become a kind of Scottish national icon. And when producing a book about it, 
our publishing team were like, yes, this is brilliant. This is a topic that people want to read about. Whereas if we had been wanting to write about the other island, they would be like, you know, nobody's going to buy this book. Class. Now, 5,000 visitors a year is obviously not that many, but for a tiny and very remote island, it's loads. And this distinction in literature, 700 books, five quite major archaeological volumes, including our own. And I, I mean, we work for the National Survey Body, which has a website, so it represents the archaeology of St Kilda with about 500 sites. And we have 6,000 items in our collection, photographs and drawings, just to give you an idea of scale. So th I want to juxtapose this with this other fantastic island, one of my favourite places, with, which, as you can see, also has a rich prehistoric and medieval past. The, the building in the photograph is a church <coughs> of the 16th century, perhaps. Um, and it has a landscape which um, speaks to some of the key narratives of this area, the key archaeological narratives of this area. Uh, elements of which aren't represented on St Kilda. So somebody mentioned earlier the clearance of, of um, <coughs> communities in, in the west of Scotland in particular. Pave speaks to that notion. Um, but it also speaks to these, some of these landscapes going to hunting and shooting and fishing. So nowadays the island is basically a private shooting estate. When I was... Um, when we produced a book about St Kilda, it's based on about 400 person days of fieldwork on this tiny, 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 tiny island. So really intense field work. My understanding of Pave is based on three days of me absolutely racing around it, trying to get a grip on its archaeological landscape. At the same time, there was this photographer there, Harry Corey Wright, who spent the three days taking eight photographs, <laughs> which are really beautiful. <laughs> and I'm kind of intentionally picking beautiful photographs of Pave. There's lots of beautiful photographs of St Kilda, so I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be slightly subversive, if you like. So Pavi nowadays is basically is virtually unknown. It's a holiday home. It's very difficult to know how many people visit it, but there's no like explicit way of getting there. It's quite difficult. You have to ask a local guy, give somebody a bottle of whiskey. Kind of know people, you know. So I went there because I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew the shepherd. It doesn't have any management um, literature at all. And look at the distinction in, in, in sites, you know, in terms of our national record. It has 40 sites as opposed to 500. It has 300 photographs, about half of which are taken by me, as opposed to 6,000. And there's one little booklet about this island. Now, from my ex personal opinion, is that it is an equally, if not more, significant archaeological landscape. So the interesting thing is, how did these things diverge to such a great extent? Now, part of this is historical. So Pave was one of the seats of the MacLeod clan early on, um, but they moved further to Sky, to Dunbegan Castle, which some of you will be aware of, um, in about 1500. So there is wider narratives of change going on here. Um, and it also suffered a massive sand blow in the 1690s, so a major environmental impact, it's quite kind of fascinating actually, which it was basically the um, richest agricultural land in that area was on this island until this point. So there's a kind of economic decline, but also, as I mentioned earlier, it was part of the same farm or tack with St Kilda and the Western Isles, as, as, as in other parts, other areas that we've been talking about, um, changes with wider historical narratives around this time. So in the 1770s, the MacLeods raised their rents massively because they're becoming, they're sort of going bankrupt. And the guy who rents these two islands emigrates to America. Now his family had had a very strong link with the two islands for three or four generations. They were also MacLeods. He emigrates and then he gets involved in um, the meta-narrative of American history. But that whole stuff is completely written out of stories about St Kilda. <coughs> um, and as a, the MacLeods do eventually go, basically go kind of bankrupt, and they sell these islands in 1779. So the islands are uh, definitely under ownership of the MacLeods for as far back as we know until 1779. Big change. Again, these, these points are not picked up in the dominant literature. 
I'm just going to skip on a little bit. Sorry. Did you say five minutes? Damn it. <laughs> um, so the, the massive thing that happened on Babi, which causes this change, is somebody mentioned earlier on that we're dealing with um, economic narratives. So the estate that owned this island and the guys that rent it make a specific economic decision that Pabe is better financially as a sheep farm than it is as a joint tenanted mixed farm. And they make that decision in 1846 and it has pretty dramatic consequences. So they wholesale removed the population of 300 people, most of whom go to Cape Breton. And from an archaeologist perspective, this means that there's lots and lots and lots of remains from before 1846. But that change is driven by you know, political and economic things. In St Kilda, at ex pretty much exactly the same time, the opposite thing happens. So that last story about Pabby, that is the norm for this part of Scotland. That is the generality of what happens. And people have been saying for years, you know, why did the St Kilda economy fail in 1930? What's so amazing about it is how did it last to 1930? Why was it not cleared in the 1830s and 1840s by the great majority of the wider area? And I haven't quite put it in print, but I'm pretty sure that it's because the estate are making a lot of money from seabirds. So the islanders are specialising in the exploitation of seabirds. They're, that's a marketised product, so they're paying all of their rent in feathers and other bird products. The whole of their rent is going to the estate, and the estate are selling it on and making a large profit. What's difficult about this, initially I said archaeologists of St Kilda, but it's a bit critical. But the archaeologies of the past have embraced this idea of St Kilda being unique. It's, this is classic sort of handmade in the history stuff. They've studied the place in isolation, and because of that they've come out with kind of isolated narratives, if you like, that don't lead to a wider perspective. And they have really reinforced historical narratives without challenging them. To some extent, they've subscribed to the kind of management consensus about the place, which is expressed in lots of different literature from the 1950s onwards. And they've reinforced these notions. What's interesting about this is that historical events in the mid 19th century are reflected now in the way we think about this place, but we're being uncritical about that. But the field archeology span of the place, which is what we really, we kind of specialize in, speaks to a completely different narrative. So it, it's about dynamism. There's change all the time. There's structures that are being built in the 1920s, the 1910s, right up to 1930. It's incredibly complex. It speaks to links with economic history. So the <coughs> field archaeology, if you like, directly challenges the typical historical narratives, and yet it's taken till now for this to come to fruition, so I think this is actually a bit of an indictment of how archaeologists have approached this place in the last two generations. The question is, of course, why is that the case? You know, who mediates the story about these landscapes? Where do we get our ideas about what St Kilda is, what this island Pabe is? I mean, when I first went to St Kilda, I had a massively romantic notion about it because I'm a massively romantic person. You know, and then that was kind of crushed by field archaeology, yeah. years of field archaeology, <laughs> and it like washed, you know, the nonsense from my eye. It was kind of a, I've had a really amazing experience being involved with this place, because my perception of it was, um, the word would be naive, and then I've slowly become less naive about it. But now that I'm able to reflect on it, you know, this story is mediated by these large organisations, the owners of the island, the National Trust for Scotland. Historic Environment Scotland, who I work for, you know, they have to express or they feel like they need to express a certain narrative about the, the place. It's a World Heritage Site, which comes with a lot of baggage and management, uh, management baggage. And it's, per, it's perceived in the media in a very specific way. And the interesting thing about the me media presentation of it is the way that they kind of think about it has its roots in academia, I think. But academia of, you know, a generation or two generations ago. And what I find really striking is how do we try and get the media to start thinking about this subject in a little bit of a more critical way so that when they talk about something like this, St Kilda, they talk about its wider context, they understand that the idea that it could have existed as a community on its own without being linked with the rest of the islands 
is completely fanciful. In a Scottish context, these islands only work as satellites of other communities because there isn't the resources there to be self-sufficient. So, shameless plug. <laughs> this, um, I tend to distinguish quite clearly between what I would say in print and what I would say in a talk. So I've given you kind of a wider sense of my criticism about how people perceive these two places, but the book that we've written is, a, is um, more sober, if you like. So it, it goes through in great detail the actual field archaeology of the island, but also the way in which it's been looked at over time. There was a copy outside for sale, but it sold within 20 minutes of the conference starting. Get it. <laughs> right, thanks. That's it. <laughs>